Hiya, my name is Serena and this is Serena Speaks and today I'll be speaking about chapter 3 of the BNF which is the respiratory system. So this one's actually quite a straightforward chapter to go through um, but first and foremost I want you to think about um, prescriptions that get given to you and that make you realise oh this person has asthma. So it might be that um, they're on a beta 2 agonist such as salbutamol or maybe that they're on ipratropium so you know that they're taking anti-muscarinic bronchodilator. Or maybe that's there on sodium chromoglycate for their exercise induced asthma. Or it could be that they're on a leukotriene receptor antagonist such as Montelukast. So depending on the stage of or the severity that a person's asthma, asthma is will depend on which medication they're taking. So a person could get an acute asthma attack and that can range from it being moderate to severe or life threatening. And so let's focus on moderate and severe. And there's five key points that we have to remember, um, which will distinguish it between moderate or severe. So first and foremost, can they talk? If they're talk talking like I am right now, that would indicate that it's moderate. Whereas if they're struggling to even finish up a sentence, that would indicate that it's most likely to be severe. Now let's look at their respiratory rate. So if their respiratory rate is below 25 breaths per minute, that indicates moderate. And if it's above 25 breaths per minute, it's severe. In terms of their pulse, if their pulse is below 110 beats per minute, then it's moderate. If it's above 110 beats per minute, then it's severe. So you can see already those three are really pretty straightforward to remember. We need to think about talking, we need to think, talk about the respiratory rate, we need to think about their pulse. Where is it? Is their respiratory rate below 25 or above 25? Is their pulse below 110 or above 110? In terms of their oxygen saturation, in both cases, it should be above or equal to 92%. If it's below 92%, then it will be life threatening. And in terms of their peak flow, their peak flow, if it's above 50%, would be moderate. 33 to 50% would be severe. And below 33% would be life threatening. Other symptoms of life threatening would also be that the person has a slow heart rate, so bradycardia, hypertension, they may get some blueness even, which is known as cyanosis, or they could get a silent chest. So we can see, actually, that's really quite simple and easy to understand, and easy to differentiate between moderate, severe, and life threatening. And just remember, with moderate to severe, can they talk? What's their respiratory rate? What's their pulse? What's their oxygen saturation? and their peak flow. And if you remember that, then that's those two covered. And in terms of life-threatening, well, it'll be the extremes. Their oxygen saturation will be a lot lower, so it'll be below 92%. Same goes with their peak flow, it'll be below 33%. And they might get blueness in the face, slow heart rate. Just try and think of it logically, um, and that way that will help. But that's how you differentiate between the three in an acute asthma. So that was acute asthma, now we'll move on to chronic asthma. And the British Thoracic Society have um, released these summary management in asthma sheets, which are so much easier to understand. And personally, I found them easier to use than actually learning it from the BNF. I've included the um, link in the description box. So have a look at that whilst I go through this next bit. I have created my own step one to step five sheets. Um, so we'll use them in conjunction. It's page nine of the British Thoracic Society on the link that I've included. So go to page nine and first and foremost, if a person has chronic asthma, step one would be that they would be put on a short acting beta two agonist such as salbutamol. Now, if that wasn't helping, then they might need to be step two into an inhaled corticosteroid. So now, what would it determine a person going from step one to step two? Well, there's three important factors. Firstly, are they using their inhaler more than three times a week? Secondly, are they getting any nighttime symptoms? And thirdly, have they had an exacerbation in the last two years? If there's a yes to any of those answers, then they will go from step one to step two. Now, a person is still not getting relief, then step three is that a long acting beta 2 agonist such as formeterol would need to be added. But if a person is still not getting full benefits or the therapy is still quite inadequate, then the inhaled corticosteroid dose could be increased. However, 
If the long acting beta 2 agonist isn't helping at all, then they need to stop it. That needs to be stopped. The inhaled corticosteroid dose needs to be increased, and they could be trialled on a leukotriene receptor antagonist such as Montelukast or slow release theophylline. So that's step three. Now, if say that still doesn't help the patient, then they'll need to go on to step four. And then step four, again, the inhaled corticosteroid dose would need to be increased. You may need to be added onto a leukotriene receptor antagonist or they might need to be added onto a slow release theophylline. So it's basically the same things as step three, um, as in this part of step three. So that's quite easy to remember them for step four. Um, and at step five, so none of that is still helping, they may, might need to be on a daily low dose of oral corticosteroid and a high dose of inhaled corticosteroid. And if that's still of no benefit, then they may need to be referred to a specialist. And for under five year olds, it's very simple. Step one, give them a SABA. Step two, give them an inhaled corticosteroid. If that doesn't work, then they might need to be given the leukotriene receptor antagonist. Step three, if that still hasn't ha wor worked, then they would be given the leukotriene receptor antagonist. Step four, they would need to be referred. So like I said, have a look at those um, pages in the British Thoracic Society document that I've, I've put the link to. Pages 9 to 11 in particular, um, they're great diagrams to use. I really, really recommend them. So that was asthma. Now let's move on to COPD. And with especially the time of year that it is now, and you get a prescription and it says tyotropium, for example, and you think, oh, yes, this person has COPD. Check, have they had their flu vaccine? Um, and I think this is really important to mention, especially for this time of year um, when it is flu season. And it's the influenza vaccine and the pneumonococcal vaccine. Check that they've had both of them. And also check if the person is smoking, is a smoker, because a person that has COPD is either usually an ex-smoker or they're currently still smoking. And once you get COPD, you can't reverse the effects of it. That's it, you've got it now. But by stopping smoking, it can really, really help the patient. So it's worth giving them some smoking cessation advice. Um, also with COPD, a person might also need to be on a mucolytic. So this will help with their chronic productive cough and it will decrease any sputum viscosity. Um, however, if there's no benefit after four weeks, then they need to come off the mucolytic. And an example is carbocysteine. Now, um, in the BNF, they go through on page 215 of the BNF 70, they have the diagram for the use of inhaled therapies in COPD. And I think it's a really nice diagram to go through. It's a really easy diagram to go through as well. So if we start off with, first and foremost, the treatment of COPD for a person will first and foremost depend on their FEV1. So your FEV1 is your forced expiratory volume, and it's the amount that you can exhale in one second. So this will either be above 50% or it'll be below 50%. So keeping that in mind, first and foremost, with a person with COPD, we'll start them off on a SABA, so a short-acting B2 agonist, such as albuterol, or SAMA, a short-acting muscarinic antagonist, so, or agonist, sorry, such as ipratropin. Now, let's focus on if the FEV1 is above 50%. If it's above 50%, then we will give them a LABA, a long-acting B2 agonist or we can give them a LAMA, a long-acting muscarinic agonist. But if they are on a LAMA, then we need to discontinue the SAMA because the two shouldn't really be given together. Now, if the person is on the LABA and they're still getting persistent exacerbations or breathlessness, then an inhaled corticosteroid can be added. And if the person is on the LAMA, and again, they're still getting persistent um, exacerbations of breathlessness, then they'll be need to put on all three, on the LABA, the LAMA, and the inhaled corticosteroid. And the same case goes in the case with the person that's on LABA and inhaled corticosteroid. If that's still not helping, then a LAMA also needs to be added, and they'll be given all three. So just to go through that again, SABA, SAMA, LABA, LAMA, but if they're on the LAMA, discontinue the SAMA. 
then on the labour, an inhaled corticosteroid might be added. Or if the person is still getting persistent exacerbations of breathlessness, they'll need to, and they're on the lama, then you need to add the lava and the inhaled corticosteroid. And if this person who's on the lava and the inhaled corticosteroid, and they're still not getting any benefit, then we add them a lama, and so they're taking all three: the lava, the lama, and the inhaled corticosteroid. So that's above 50%. Now, what if we're below 50%? So if their FEV1 is below 50%. Same starting point, SABA or SAMA. Then, if it's below, FEV1 is below 50%, they could be put on a LABA plus an inhaled corticosteroid or on a LAMA. And again, if they're on the LAMA, discontinue the SAMA. Now, if that LABA and inhaled corticosteroid isn't helping, then a LAMA would be added. And they'd be on a LAMA, a LABA and an inhaled corticosteroid. And it's exactly the same for the LAMA. If the LAMA is not helping, then they'll be given the LABA and the inhaled corticosteroid, so they're on three, all three, LABA, LAMA, and inhaled corticosteroid. It's actually quite simple once you go through it quite a few times. And like I said, I think the diagram of the BNF explains that and summarizes that really nicely. So just keep going over and over again. And what I would say is, with extracts like these, take a picture, um, blow them up, make a poster out of it, um, and even the, the Chronic asthma um, post is page 9 to 11 in that other URL link um, that I've put. Make posters of those and stick them around your room, your house, your wherever it is that you frequently go to. Just stick them around and just keep reciting it to yourself and it will come to you because it is actually fairly simple to know. It just takes a while to practice, practice, practice. So that's asthma versus COPD. And now I'm very briefly going to touch upon croup. So croup can be a bacterial or a viral infection, and it um, causes inflammation and narrowing of the airways. Usually it's self-limiting, but a single dose of a corticosteroid, such as dexamethasone, 150 micrograms per kilogram, can help, and adrenaline can help as well. So we've talked about the different conditions. Now let's talk about and focus on the actual medication. So if we start off with adrenoceptor agonists, so our beta 2 agonists, our SABAs and our LABAs. So examples of our short acting beta 2 agonists are, for example, salbutamol, terbutaline, and these usually have immediate effects of usually around three to five hours. Whereas our long acting beta 2 agonists, such as ormeterol or um, salmeterol, their effects usually last for 12 hours. And remember previously I mentioned um, in one of the earlier videos that the best way to learn is actually, and the best way to revise is whilst you're on the job. Well, a good way that you can do that is, say a prescription gets presented to you and it says um, Simbacort inhaler. You then need to think to yourself, okay, what's in Simbacort inhaler? Right, it's formeterol and it's budesonide. Okay, what is formeterol though? Formeterol is my long-acting beta 2 agonist. Right, what's budesonide? That is my um, inhaled corticosteroid. So then you know, okay, this person's on a LABA and they're on an ICS, an inhaled corticosteroid. So then you can think to yourself, okay, is it asthma or is it COPD that I have? And then you can think to yourself, okay, which stage, or if it was COPD, which stage of COPD is it that this patient is at then? If you then look further down um, the prescription and it says tiotropium, then you know that, okay, this patient is on a LAMA, a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. So they must have really persistent exacerbations of breathlessness um, for them to be on all three, on the um, inhaled corticosteroid, on the LABA and on the LAMA. So like I said, try and revise as much as you can at work um, and try to actively learn because that will really, really help you um, when later on when the exam comes and when you're practicing as a pharmacist. So the main side effects with associated with adrenoceptor agonists is hypokalemia. Now, in the exam question, they could ask you which of these causes hypokalemia. Salbutamol could be an option there, and they're very likely to include an option there that causes hyperkalemia, such as ACE inhibitors, just to catch you out. So try and make a list of which ones cause hypokalemia, which ones cause hyperkalemia, because it will help you later on anyway. So try and make a list of that. So, yep, side effects, hypokalemia. Um, and you can also use space devices or even pressurized meter dose devices. 
Then we have anti-muscarinic anti bronchodilators. So your ipratropium and your tiotropium. So ipratropium is used in short term for relief in COPD and um, chronic asthma. And its maximum effects are usually 30 to 60 minutes after use. And whereas with the tiotropium, so with the long acting, um, it's used, the only indication actually for tiotropium, licensed indication, is for COPD. Now they're anti-muscarinic bronchodilators, so side effects are going to be those associated with anti-muscarinic effects. So your dry mouth, um, nausea, headache, and particularly with ipratropium and nebulized salbutamol, a uh, big side effect associated with them is actually glaucoma. So theophylline. Theophylline is one of the high risk drugs, so it means that we need to know a bit more about it. So it mostly comes as a modified release preparation. So there are delays in toxicity. Some of the symptoms of toxicity are vomiting, restlessness, convulsions. And if a person does experience convulsions, then usually lorazepam or diazepam is what's given to them. Um, they can be given repeated doses of activated charcoal if they have an overdose of theophylline. And that's usually if more than an hour has elapsed. And it's really important that with theophylline it's prescribed by brand because bioavailability does differ between different brands. Now theophylline is a funny one in that its plasma theophylline concentration can increase or decrease depending on different factors. So for example plasma theophylline concentration decreases in a person who is a cigarette smoker. So that means that, that if, they depend, if they decide that, okay, I'm going to stop smoking from now on, their theophylline concentration is then going to start increasing, which means that their overall dose needs to be reduced. The same is, can be seen with um, alcohol consumption and in drugs that induce metabolism. Whereas in cases where plasma theophylation is increased, it's increased in um, viral infections, in hepatic impairment, in the elderly, heart failure, and drugs that inhibit metabolism. Usually the safe range for theophylline is between 10 to 20 milligrams per litre, um, and that's usually what's needed for satisfactory bronchodilation, and it has a narrow therapeutic index. And aminophilophilin, that's a hard one. Aminophilin, aminophilin, aminophilin is twice more soluble than theophylline. Um, and yeah, so those are the main points for theophylline. Um, but like I said, it is a high risk medicine. So with the high risk medicines, you need to know those extra little itty bitty details about them. Moving on to drug delivery systems. So there's many different drug delivery systems. We have pressurized mucidose inhalers, um, breath actuated spaces, dry powder inhalers. Um, and you need to know which ones are your mucidose inhalers and which ones are your dry powder inhalers. So your mucidose inhalers, for example, are your EVA inhalers. So serotide, QVAR. Examples of your dry powder inhalers are your hand inhalers um, like titropium or your turbo inhalers such as Simpacor. Switching from a pressurized mesodose dose inhaler to a dry powder inhaler, a patient can get a cough and um, patients aren't advised to switch between space devices. They should be replaced every six to 12 months and they should be washed once a month and left to drip dry. Don't clean them with a towel or a cloth or anything because then that can generate static. So it just needs to be washed once a month and left to drip dry. And that's a really key counselling point to give to your patients. Now, in terms of nebulizers, nebulizers turn a solution of a drug and they make it into an aerosol for inhalation. And the benefit of them is that they can give higher doses of a drug um, to the airways than compared to standard inhalers. So if we go on to corticosteroids, um, corticosteroids, so if you use them for three to four weeks and a patient seems to gain benefit from them, that indicates that they have asthma. If they've been taking a corticosteroids and they're not getting that much improvement, then that indicates COPD. So in terms of asthma, it will reduce the airways inflammation and it's used usually in the prophylaxis of asthma. With COPD, it may reduce exacerbations when given in combination with a LABA, which we saw earlier. And with beclometazone in particular, 
a patient, uh, the brand name needs to be written on the prescription, whether it's QVAR or Clenil Modulite, because the two shouldn't be interchanged. And the reason for that is because QVAR contains finer particles. Um, and so if a person, it's, if it just says generically beclometazone, you need to ask the patient which one it is they usually get. Is it the QVAR? Is it the clinical modulite? Or double check with their GP. But it is so important that they stay and stick to the same brand, like with the theophylline. Other examples of corticosteroids that are used in COPD are mimetazone, budesonide, fliticasone. Um, so there's quite a few. And um, if a person's on corticosteroids, especially long term, they need to carry around a steroid card with them. So that's another key counselling point to check with your patients that are on um, long term corticosteroids. And the main side effect of them <coughs> is um, oral candidiasis, so oral thrush. So again, key counselling point is to tell your patients to rinse their mouth out with water after inhalation of inhaled corticosteroid to reduce the risk of getting oral candidiasis. Now, very briefly, um, chromoglycate and related therapies, so sodium chromoglycate, nidacromil, they're usually used three to four times a day and they need to be withdrawn gradually, usually over a week. Um, usually side effects that are associated with them are irritation, cough, um, even bronchospasms. You also have your leukotriene receptor antagonists, which we mentioned earlier, so um, Montelukast if you're above six months old, or Zafirlukast if you're more equal to or more than 12 years old. Um, and you also have your phosphodiesterase type 4 inhibitors. For example, Roflumilast. Roflu, I really don't know why they make these names so complicated, seriously, but Roflumilast, um, and that's associated with anti-inflammatory properties, and it's usually used in severe COPD with associated um, associated with chronic bronchitis. Just another note I want to make about inhalers: they do like to ask really obscure questions about them. Um, for example, which inhaler changes from one colour to another colour, um, or which inhaler is associated with um, a dose count, or which ones don't have a dose counter. So try and know as much specific little itty bitty details about them as you can. Um, so for example, something like the Eclera Genuere, that changes from green to red. Um, the, the generic name is Aclindium. Um, an inhaler without a dose counter is, for example, Easy Breathe. Those with a dose counter are Ellipta, Genuere, Nextaler, so try to learn as much as you can about each individual inhaler, inhaler as, in as much detail as you can. So let's move on to antihistamines. So they can be used in cases of nasal allergy, for hay fever, and there's different formulations, some for the nose, for the eyes, for the skin, um, and essentially they reduce rhinorrhea, so a runny nose, and sneezing. And they can be used for uticarial rashes, for pruritus, stings, insect bites and in the case of um, extreme when it's anaphylaxis for example um, a patient might even need IV chlorphenamine. So with antihistamines you have some that are more sedating than others so for example promethazine is quite sedating um, less so is chlorphenamine and then you have the ones which are non-sedating Personally, I don't like to use the word non-sedating. I like to say less sedating because there is still a potential that they could be slightly sedating. So examples of the non-sedating ones are um, cetirizine, loratadine, desloratadine. And when you're giving a person an antihistamine, whether it's a sedating one or a non-sedating one, make sure to tell them to caution if they're drinking um, or avoid excess alcohol and to caution with driving. Um, also some cautions and contraindications with antihistamines are, for example, in epileptics, in those with liver disease and extremes of ages, so adults, um, elderly and children. Now there's also allergen immunotherapy, which I actually think is really quite clever. And they use the, the um, immunotherapy, it uses an allergen vaccine containing either grass pollen, tree pollen, dust mite, and what the aim is, it's to reduce asthma symptoms and rhinoconjunctivitis by using immunotherapy. So they also use like um, wasp venom or bee venom and um, 
they try and use that via immunotherapy to reduce the risk of severe anaphylaxis um, in patients who are allergic to, to bees and wasp venom. Um, they should though be avoided in pregnancy, in children under five, and those that are on either beta blockers or ACE inhibitors. Now moving on to allergic emergencies. So if someone gets an anaphylactic reaction, you need to give them adrenaline. So adrenaline will come as 500 micrograms or 300 micrograms. It needs to be given intramuscularly at a 90 degree angle into the thigh. And you can repeat it five to 15 minutes if necessary. If a person does end up in um, an anaphylactic reaction because of an allergy, they may also be needed, um, they may also be given oxygen, IV chlorphenamine, um, even hydrocortisone by intravenous. So some things that trigger off um, and an or precipitate anaphylaxis in asthmatics are, for example, eggs, shellfish, latex, or even NSAIDs. That's why it's so important that if a patient wants to buy ibuprofen, you ask them, are you asthmatic? Have you taken it before? Um, same with aspirin, you need to double check with them. So in terms of respiratory stimulants and pulmonary surfactants, respiratory stimulants are usually given under specialist supervision. An example is doxapram, and it's indicated for the treatment of ventrally, ventilatory failure in patients with COPD. Um, and in terms of pulmonary surfactants, it's used in the management of respiratory distress syndrome in neonates and preterm neonates. And moving on to oxygen. So oxygen is indicated for hypoxemia, or in other words, a person that doesn't have enough oxygen, they need oxygen. So high concentrations are usually given in patients who have anaphylaxis, shock, sepsis, pneumonia, um, and low concentration um, oxygen therapy are reserved for patients, for example, those that have COPD, cystic fibrosis. And if a person is a smoker, but they need um, oxygen therapy, they need to have smoking cessation because they can't be smoking when oxygen is around because it's flammable. Um, that wouldn't be very good. So provide smoking cessation to those patients. So let's move on to aromatic inhalation and cough preparations. So a patient might come to you and after fully assessing them, you might realise that they're on too many medications. So actually for their bunged up nose, um, something in tablet form wouldn't be best for them. What you can give them is menthol and eucalyptus inhalation because this will encourage deliberate inspiration of warm, moist air, which will essentially relieve nasal obstruction. So it'll help them breathe a lot easier. In terms of cough suppressants, so a cough can be one of three things. It can be a symptom, a side effect or an association. So if it's a symptom, it could be, for example, a symptom of asthma. If it's a side effect, it could be a side effect of, say, an ACE inhibitor or it could be associated with something, for example, if they're a smoker. Now, um, an example of a um, cough suppressant is codeine. Um, Personally, I don't like to give out codeine to patients because there is that risk of dependency. They're also sedate, it's quite sedating. You could give vulcadine as um, an alternative because that is less sedating. Um, but it, I mean, you have to assess the patient yourself. You need to see what's what would be the best thing for them. Um, another example of cost suppressant is dextrin with borfen. Um, and Again, in an, exam, in an exam, they could give out a list of different um, excipients and they might say, which of these is best for a dry cough? Which of these would be best for a person who has a lot of mucus? So in case of a cough suppressant, codeine, um, vulcadine, dextromethorphan. If a person need, just needs like a simple demulcent, so they have like a dry cough, then something like um, something containing glycerol or syrup, so simple linctus, that would be great. Um, if they have an expectorant cough, so they've got a lot of phlegm, a lot of mucus, then guanethacin would be the best thing to give to them. And in palliative care, it's usually morphine that's given for um, a person for, for their cough. And cough suppressants um, in general are recommended for under six year olds. Um, it's usually six to 12 and then 12 to adult that they're recommended for under six, try to avoid. I mean, you can get simple linked to um, paediatric and you can get Tixilix, which is usually just with glycerol and that's fine. I think 
for some of them it's even like one years old um, so that those ones are fine but some of the other ones like the dextrin methorphans the guanefacins not recommended for under six year olds and um, systemic nasal decongestions so um, an over-the-counter one example is pseudoephedrine or brand name Sudafed. But with pseudoephedrine, we need to be thinking, oh, our MEP. So there's a lot of legalities that are associated with pseudoephedrine. So it is illegal to sell or supply more than or equal to 720 milligrams of pseudoephedrine or more than or equal to 180 milligrams of ephedrine um, without a prescription. And it's also illegal to sell um, pseudoephedrine and ephedrine together. So be aware of that. And pseudoephedrine can be cautioned in diabetics, in those with hypertension, and it should be avoided in those taking mono -ex monoamine um, oxidase inhibitors. Now, the nasal decongestants aren't as effective as these systemic decongestants, but they don't give rise to rebound congestion. So that's one of the benefits that the nasal ones have over the um, systemic um, decongestants. And finally, antifibrinolytics. So these are indicated for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, an example is pifenidone, um, and they exert antifibrinolytic and anti-inflammatory properties. So that's the respiratory system. Like I said, it's actually a really straightforward one. Um, what I will do is, with the little diagrams and pages that I've made, I will upload them onto the Facebook, my Facebook page, which is www.facebook.com slash Serena Speaks. Um, so I'll upload them on there, because hopefully that will then um, help you. And yeah, and hopefully you now have a better understanding of the respiratory system and realise that it's actually not too bad a one to go over. But I hope you like this video. Please give it a thumbs up, give it a like, share, subscribe, check out our Facebook page. And I will be posting videos every Thursday. Um, so make sure to look out for that. And um, thank you for watching. Until next time, I'm Serena and this is Serena Speaks. Thank you. Happy revisings.